Marketing, and uh, welcome to the April SVFIG Zoom conference. I see the recording light is lit, so thank you, Brad. All right, let's see. Falvo or sub Falvo like phenomenon? I don't see him. Did he know that it was 9 30? <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> you, you're not here. <laughs> All right. Philip's here, though. Philip's here. All right. <laughs> you're on, Philip. Introduce yourself and uh, somebody uh, assign him the uh, sharing your screen privilege. Everybody else, mute. Mute. So. Can you see my screen? I hope so. I can see it. Excellent. So my name is Philip. Um, I got involved in Forth something like 30 years ago. And uh, then there was a long break, which recently got interrupted again or ended. So I got into the community, community and into the, the general topic. And uh, what I wanted to talk to today is um, a feature in Volksforth. So that has been by matter of opportunity more than anything else, uh, my fourth of choice um, most of the time. Uh, a feature that I always thought was present in every fourth and recently learned it wasn't. So I thought it might be interesting to um, show it a little bit. And that's... Um, temporary headers and a way to create uh, basically headerless code uh, in a fourth that is well not tethered uh, the project where this whole thing came to be and that that motivated it uh, was the desire to write a c compiler on the commodore 64 we're talking the late 80s here and the first approach that i did was with a macro assembler lib and uh, I soon, apart from assembling, becoming very slow after writing a scanner and a symbol table, I started to get concerned about code size and searched for a better language, ended up with Volksforth, actually Ultraforth. It was called for the Commodore 64 back then uh, because in the Commodore space, things needed to have boastful names, I heard recently. And Typical story, I guess, grew to love forth, took my first design lessons, as I would uh, or like to think back then from Leo Brody's thinking forth. In particular, the splitting up of a uh, project into components uh, with an interface. I took the name, name terminology from the German translation of thinking forth that I had back then. And um, as the thing grew, code size did remain a bit of a concern. Um, I did wonder how Anders Halsberg ever managed to uh, get the Turbo Pascal into the 64 that he did back then. So, and that was kind of the experience that I was, in the end, hoping to somehow achieve. Um, and then, but sort of the thing that, that mitigated the whole code size concern is uh, Volksforth's ability to create headerless words in a turnkey application, namely to make uh, headers uh, temporary. And this is done with this simple pipe sign as a prefix to a definition. If you do that, then the lingo is uh, Volksforth will put the name, the header onto the heap. So this heap is not a heap in the C star, not something that you can allocate things from and free things on in a relatively arbitrary fashion. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is it's something like a downward growing temporary dictionary. Uh, the interface of the thing is you get the address of it. So the lower address, uh, you can allocate things heap alloc is the, the, the name. You can clear the entire heap and you can 
ask for the next definition to be placed on the heap. Um, and the the key thing with uh, with this clear is um, <clears throat> once you do uh, you you call that, then all the headers that you placed on the heap are gone, and the code is still there, and you've got headerless code. The memory map in Volksforth looks roughly like this, and the heap is placed underneath, or well, underneath the downwards growing data stack, or between data stack and uh, user variables, which means if you allocate something on the heap, the actual stack gets moved. I placed the code of uh, heap alloc here in the, on the slide because I found that a nice piece of stack robotics. I think at some point in the future, I'm actually going to, uh, just for my own sake, add proper intermediate stack comments to it. But um, well, all it really does is it moves the data stack down and changes the, the location of that you get with heap. And uh, the word headers, then if you do this, Heap placing um, look like this. You've got one additional flag next to restrict and immediate that is indirect. It's the uh, hex 20 bit in the, in the length byte. And if a word has that set, then after the name doesn't come the code, but first a pointer, and the pointer will come point to the code. It's a, uh, by the way, Volksforth is an uh, ITC fourth, so. The rest is, is uh, very conventional. One nice side use that uh, they also make of this uh, indirect slash pointer mechanism is to alias words. So you can uh, just create a second name, maybe in a different uh, vocabulary for any, for any code, for any word. It's quite useful. And one other nice use that uh, uh, they make of this heap is you can place the assembler, the entire assembler on the on the heap. They have that prepared as a as a loads or back then it was a load screen. Uh, nowadays it's uh, it's a wrapping file. And all you do is you remember here uh, you allocate the space that you need on the heap, uh, store it to to the dictionary pointer, load your code restore the dictionary pointer. And lo and behold, you've got an assembler, <clears throat> which allows you to put code words into an application without having to ship the assembler afterwards. And of course, this is, uh, uh, Bill, this is your old, or based on your old 6502 assembler. The memory I gained with that, so uh, for, for my project, maybe first a, a little look at the um, uh, word list that you get. All, um, uh, all words that are placed on the heap will get displayed with this pipe prefix. So this is with, altogether it's about 800 names in the, in the compiler vocabulary. Uh, that's what you actually get when you, when you do <clears throat> look at the words there. And after a clear, only the CC, the invocation will be, will be left. And that amounts to almost 14K uh, of uh, names plus the, plus the assembler, of course, which given that the code is only 18K plus 14K of, of fourth court, uh, core underneath is actually a really appreciated and really useful um, yeah, gain of additional memory. Might be, if it hadn't been for that, uh, uh, that I could have abandoned the project as not really feasible because you wouldn't have any space left for a, for a symbol table or, or any other code storage or something. So that, was, that went well. And uh, on the C64, and then a bit later on the C60, uh, 16, um, I was able to 
and this was after the long break uh, to actually release and uh, open source the thing year, year and a half ago or something like that. And um, then came the next memory challenge in the form of the Commander X16, which is one of these new retro computers based on the 65 CO2, the uh, Western Digital, uh, uh, Western Design Center, uh, CMOS variant. Uh, and that happens to have only a <clears throat> close to 38K of contiguous RAM. The um, IO area, memory mapped IO, is in the unfriendly, in this respect, location of 9F00. And this was just, just not enough to, uh, even with, um, well, during the, during the compile, placing the symbols onto the heap doesn't, of course, save you any memory. It only saves it uh, after you're done and you clear it out and uh, save the whole system. And what to do? And the idea I then had is, what if I made use of my nicely designed interfaces and kept only the interfaces of each module until the end of the, of the build, of the load, and threw the temporary names inside each module away after it's, after it's compiled. And um, which then amounted to a concept like a, like a two-stage heap somewhat corresponding with local and global var uh, uh, variables or words. And yeah, that would use a bit of the, of the RAM for, for local word headers uh, and hopefully get me there. To get there, I had to understand the heap me mechanism of Volksforth. So the two key words here are, well, this Pipe sign is really just setting setting a variable. Interestingly, <clears throat> it sets it to minus one if you uh, if it isn't set already. And create checks this variable, and if it's set set, uh, it increases it. In parentheses uh, that allows you to set it to a larger negative value to put a number of um, of words onto the heap in, in one go. And then it does some of the initial create stuff, does this heap move, which moves the, word, the, the header, the name, plus the link. I think it's, it's all created first and then it's all moved onto the heap. And uh, this um, indirect flag is set and then the rest of create is done. So that was relatively straightforward to understand. The second part that I needed, of course, was uh, cleaning out that temporary heap again. And there things became a little bit hairy. And uh, want to call out in particular two words, remove and endpoints, they are called, which are called by this clear, which clears the heap, and also by forget. The result was I couldn't reuse them, at least not very well. <clears throat> uh, I found them too, too intricate. One of the things that they do is sort of, you've got these two, um, uh, the upwards growing dictionary and the downwards growing heap. If you want to forget to a certain word, you have to keep track of both of those pointers and do the right things. <laughs> but one of the outcome of the uh, investigation was um, added code comments to the Foxforth code base. So conclusion there, okay, this bit I have to write, uh, write new, dedicated, which wasn't very difficult then after all. Um, but the first goal was I wanted to make this, this mechanism here extendable so that I could plug my, my um, temporary heap, my two-stage heap thing in without having to carry it around every time and do that at um, the least possible sort of fixed costs for everybody who doesn't need it, doesn't want it. 
And the conclusion we arrived at, uh, I discussed that with um, Carsten Strutmann, uh, main maintainer of Volksforth, and also a bit with uh, Uli Hoffmann. We came to the conclusion to do one <clears throat> slightly breaking change here. So the uh, discounting uh, question head variable is now replaced by a question head move uh, execution token. And if that is set, then it's called and the, um, uh, the pipe word turns into setting this to a heap move once, which does one heap move and then switches the, uh, the execution token off again. And this also brought the, the opportunity to introduce two, two new words, words, which essentially take the function of the previously, I want to get seven or 20 or the usual practice actually was until I reset the, the variable again, uh, words with temporary header pipe on and pipe off. And those have actually proven quite, quite useful as well. And the, <clears throat> with that in place, the implementation was actually relatively easy. Um, I ended up doing three different implementations for, for this, I call it temp heap. Uh, a default one, which places the temp heap on the heap, uh, allocates a fixed, uh, a fixed size on the heap at the beginning of the, of the compile. You have to make up your mind how much you want there. And um, uh, yeah, the rest is, is uh, relatively uh, straightforward, except for this one, remove temp words. That's a little bit more code, but uh, it just goes through all the, through the list of recurve vocabularies. And for each, <clears throat> for each header checks, is it on the temp heap? And if yes, then it uh, hooks it out of the list. And you use the temp heap with this double pipe word, which does the same thing as the pipe word for that normal heap, um, calls this uh, temp heap move once word. Uh, yeah, quite, uh, quite the same, just using a different allocation mechanism. And a nice thing for the X16, where the, the memory was so tight in the first place, is it does have a banked uh, memory area from uh, A triple O of 8K. And <clears throat> I could easily place the, the temp heap there with a fixed size, of course. And the third option, it was very easy with a few uh, aliases uh, to create an, uh, a null implementation which turned out to be useful for the uh, Commodore 16, which has as yet plenty of memory and doesn't need this. And then this, this is an idea that took me embarrassing long to, to arrive at. I was reasonably happy that I needed something like between 200 and 240 bytes uh, additional weight in order to um, be able to use this temp heap mechanism when building the compiler. But of course, the temp heap code can live on the heap because after building, you don't need it anymore. Same principle as with the transient assembler. And then, then again, you can place the assembler on the temp heap. So you, <clears throat> you only need, um, need the, the memory for the assembler during times uh, where you're actually compiling code words or for modules where you're actually compiling code words. And the final question then was, okay, what is the, what is the size I want to allocate for, the, for this temp heap on the, on the C64 where I had around that time also outgrown the memory that I had on the, on the X16 was clear it would be, would be 8K. And the initial idea was, well, I'll just um, clear the temp heap after each module and then see what's the large, which, which one has the largest internal 
uh, vocabulary, uh, the largest internal list of word headers, that's how I should say it, uh, and allocate it with that size. This is the, the, the list of uh, modules I had back then and uh, the order in which they were loaded uh, from low level to high level. And then I found that I had one, so this approach had one snag. Four of those model, uh, modules had very, very wide interfaces from parser to code generator, from code generator to virtual assembler, and from the virtual assembler to the actual 6502 uh, assembler. Basically, every parsing node has a call into the code gen, code gen and uh, every virtual instruction has a, has a call into the virtual assembler and the 6502 assembler needs to be present anyway. And with, uh, so this meant that quite a lot of, quite a lot of words still needed to be on the, on the regular heap, even though, um, no, not even though, they were interface, so they landed on the regular heap, but they were, there was a lot of them. So the, the space I saved with this approach just wasn't enough. And then I arrived at the concept of module groups. So I started to look at the whole project and that was actually quite interesting, quite fun to look at what are the, what are the, the module dependencies? What do they really look like? Who works closely with what? And um, the most interesting thing I find is that I was able to fit the, uh, those four modules that I just, just mentioned, uh, the two assemblers, the code gen and the parser into, uh, into one sort of module group, which together didn't exceed eight kilobytes of, uh, of temporary names. And with this grouping, then the memory uh, was enough. So with this, um, loading order and a, and a temp clear in, in after each of these blocks, the 37 and three quarters of kilobytes were enough and the thing compiled on the X16. Yeah, to wrap this up, without, without these headerless words, I think the whole f uh, thing might not have been feasible. I'm pretty happy that the, the approach for the X16 worked because it would be would have been somewhat embarrassing to say, yeah, I can't compile this on a machine which has 512K or two megabytes of, of uh, bank RAM. Sorry, I just don't know how to handle it. Or it would have been a quite a bit of a hassle to break this whole code into more, yeah really independent uh, parts which with, with bank switching in between. And uh, I found it also quite fun to, to really delve into, uh, into an existing projects with which you've, you've uh, spent a lot of time and look at the inner structure and the dependencies when before you've just seen it as a, as a layered list of dependencies to see what's the, uh, what does the, the dependency graph really look like. Yes, and that's all I have. Are there any questions? There's a couple oh. of questions in the chat window. Oh. Uh, how do I see the chat window while presenting? You have to you have, you have to go back to your original screen. It should be James Newton. Read your question aloud, please. So, how do you decide or track which words to make temporary, and which ones should be non-temporary? Is that is that is there an automated process for that, or is that something that you do? manually like you know at this point i'm never going to need this word again so you know go ahead 
dump the, or I'm never going to use these words again. So dump the header no. memory. Or, or is there an automated way of doing that during the load? No, so I did it. I did it manually. Um, uh, basically, deciding this is this is interface uh, and everything that's interface of a module uh, gets to live on the normal piece. Yeah, everything that that's music not is not coming from me, so I don't know who's playing music, but I can't hear it now. <laughs> okay. so. All right, no worries. Um, anything that's uh, that's internal uh, goes on the temp heap. So it's it's basically like uh, um, like you would define methods as public or or private in a Java class or something like that. Okay, so it, so it's basically it's a manual thing. You say I know that this word is something that I'm going to want to forget, um, and that and I'll, I'll be able to stop using. And so you just flag it that way, and then later on you just correct forget correct it. yeah that makes yeah. Sense. And then the second question I had was. Um, when you were exploring the dependencies between the, the modules, um, a, a, again, was that done automatically, or did you write no. some kind of a tool to? You wrote a tool to do that. No, no. I so in, in part, in part, I knew. So, for example, the the uh, uh, parts and Kogan uh, and virtual assembler dependency was uh, was clear enough, and um, I just experienced. In, in, some parts I just experimented. So I uh, changed the load order, uh, placed temp clears here and there, and saw do I get, uh, does it load or doesn't it load? So experimental computer science. And then the, the last thing is, I, I'm, I'm assuming that the, the modern solution of this is virtual memory and swapping RAM blocks out to hard drive and all that kind of stuff. But obviously that that couldn't be done on the the C64 since there was no there's no way to to have a, a, a fake or a virtual memory map. And also, I don't I mean, I don't know the C64 very well, but I mean, obviously, there's there's no hard drive. There isn't even a floppy interface, is there? There is. There is. But oh, okay. It, so so you could have done virtual memory to a floppy, maybe. Yeah, I could I could do that, uh, but um, I think sort of managing managing the pointer pointers in the dictionary would then become well, let's say really it, interesting. Basically impossible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting work, by the way. That's, that's was... a really good. It was a cool presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So now I've also got the got the chat. Christopher has a. Yeah. So I'm just amazed at how tiny memory this these fourth applications use. And I'm a Python developer. You know, we tend to have gigabytes of memory floating around and. It's just like this huge, I don't even know quite what to ask. It's just a huge cognitive dissonance. I mean, what, I guess recently they said Linux had like millions of lines of code or are all these guys, mm. just, yeah. why isn't everything this tiny? What's, I, I, I just, I can't make sense of this. Maybe you guys can help me. A lot of it has to do with reuse. You get to reuse things a lot and uh, that, that allows you to also think a little better about what you're going to reuse. Uh, typically in uh, C, for instance, you try to do it with libraries, but the trouble is, is if you pick up somebody else's library, you also pick up their junk. So it's never, never a clean way to go. I think the other aspect of this too is knowing that you just don't need stuff that you don't need. Um, for example, a lot of the fourth environments on the Commodore 64, um, they've got libraries for dealing with graphics, but it's not built in. It's somewhere off on, you know, located on a, a range of blocks or it's located in some file. Um, yeah. The actual core fourth environment is a text mode environment. So that's all it has built into the binary. Whereas with Linux, when you compile a typical Linux kernel today, you've got drivers for you know, three or four different Wi-Fi modules. You've got three, at least minimum, three different uh, USB host controller interfaces. Um, you've got, um, you know, 
a, a plurality of, of network card interfaces that all get compiled in. Um, and so you end up with the, this kernel, which has, you know, like you say, millions upon millions of lines of code, some of which are needed, some of which are not. Um, but they're all part of the single blob of, you know, uh, program that we call Linux. Whereas with fourth, it's not like that. You, you very surgically um, exclude or include the code that you need. And so you end up with something on the order of kilobytes or in the worst of cases, hundreds of kilobytes. But, you know, we're, we're still looking at something which is three orders of magnitude smaller than your typical uh, commercially developed uh, software system. What, yeah. Believe it or not, we're actually running into that problem today in a relatively modern system doing uh, development under C because the, the issue that we're having is that we have to do a lot of math on this particular project that I'm working on right now. And, you know, the, the obvious option is just load a math library. So we go out and we load a math library and then our executable ends up taking up so much RAM <laughs> that the, the, you know, the rest of our functionality starts to suffer because, because we're out of, we're out of memory to run the program. The executable becomes so large that it impacts, um, operational performance and so now we're having to go back and and rewrite these math routines from scratch in C in order to be able to do what what you were just saying you know in order to be able to only take out the parts that we that we wanted which is which is something that this method and uh, that was presented and and forth in general you know would support probably much better um, it's been an amazing amount of work trying to understand the, the the way that these math libraries have parts that that interrelate to each other and like this part depends on that part but that part depended on the other part and, and so on and so forth which is why i was asking about like you know you know do you, do you have some good method of figuring out dependencies mm. and things like that i'm i'm old in the in the realm where you can do that manually still so sorry <laughs> All right, thank you, Philip. And Thank I you. see uh, Casey.